Hi, everybody. Uh, and uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces and uh, make some new friends as well. So I'm Sammy Saab. I work with Dr. Han and the rest of the pathologists here. And today, in the next 20 minutes, um, I'll be telling a story about how to evaluate patients with COVID um, who you're seeing. Uh, first, my disclosures, uh, speaker, bureau, and consultant. So in the next 20 minutes, we want to cover three very important aims. We want to define, you know, what are the hepatic manifestations of COVID infection uh, in your patients? Number two, we're going to highlight the mechanism of action. You know, how do these problems occur? And lastly, and, and, and kind of a fun topic, it talk about, you know, when you have a patient in clinic who you're seeing for the very first time or in follow-up, and their liver tests all of a sudden are high. What should you ask? You need to ask, when did they get their COVID vaccine? So we're gonna talk about some data about how COVID vaccines can be associated with liver injury and even mimicking autoimmune hepatitis. So first, this is a paper that came out at, you know, when COVID was its hardest two years ago. And the AGA you know, had this summary of best practices. They say that in patients with elevated liver tests, you know, in, who have COVID, you know, you know, think about other things. Think about common things, hepatitis B and C, and medications, fatty liver, et cetera. Don't just chalk up all the patient liver tests to COVID. We have a wide differential. And if people are hospitalized with suspected or known COVID, you know, get baseline liver tests. Because these liver tests could change as a reflection of, of therapies uh, and other little complications. And, and lastly, lastly, you know, when people in the, are being you know, hospitalized for drug treatment of COVID, you know, look for some of these adverse effects. So this is a, an old slide from two years ago, but it highlights that COVID is a systemic problem. It can pretty much affect every organ in your body. I just saw a patient on, on Wednesday um, who, who declined a vaccine for two years. And this guy is admitted with shortness of breath and chest pain. Developed myocarditis from COVID. To the point that now he's got a heart failure and he's got a pacemaker. COVID can affect the whole body. What's fascinating, as you know, there are a number of variants, right? And these all affect us different ways. Two years ago, we were all struck by, you know, by the uh, impact on the sense of smell and taste. Back in December and January, people got COVID. You know, it, it was more myalgia and arthralgia. So, so how these COVID variants impact the liver, you know, we just don't know, you know, how they're going to differ. So this is a very important slide. And basically it tells you when you've seen a patient and there's a change of clinical status, you know, Society is difficult control. Encephalopathy is worse. You know, you got to think in the back of your mind, could this be precipitated? Could it be worsened by COVID? And we have a lot of data showing that, that people's liver conditions could change with COVID infection, COVID super infection. Um, this is a nice paper published last year in one of our GI journals highlighting that people with liver disease are at risk of having more complications for COVID. So let's get now to the liver injury patterns. So hepatic manifestation can be put in different buckets. We can talk about how COVID raises liver enzymes. And it's a manifestation of your COVID infection. We can talk about thrombosis. You know, we all heard about how COVID caused an increase of, you know, of increased thrombosis state. We're going to talk about cholangiopathy how COVID could precipitate a secondary cholangitis that's deadly. And last, we're going to talk about something sort of related to vaccines. So, um, so this is a paper that we published early on. It was one of the first papers looking at, at COVID hepatic injury. And we combed through the literature. We found about over 3,000 know, 3, patients in the medical literature. And, and, uh, and we found that you know, about a quarter of individuals who with COVID have elevated liver tests, about a quarter. And, and, how co and when your liver tests are elevated in the context of co-infection, you know, it's a harbinger of poor outcomes, 
harbinger of hospitalizations, hosp- harbinger of the need for ICU care, harbinger of need for ventilation, and of death. So having elevated little tests in the patient with COVID, it's a harbinger of poor outcomes. And if you look here, the range is mostly a parenchymal problem. You know, most times when we see COVID-induced liver injury, the liver tests are around 100. But you see here, that could go up to several thousand. Kelvin Nguyen, a good friend of ours, who's a physician in Orange County, called me about a year and a half, two years ago, about a patient with COVID who was pregnant. And the liver tests were several thousand. Um, and he ended up doing a biopsy, and it ended up being all COVID-related. So when you think about, about patients with COVID, think also about daily. And you're going to hear a great talk by one of our local experts, Dino Choi, very shortly about that. But when you think about drug and liver injury, the context of COVID, think about different buckets. You know, drugs that target the liver, right? that's a fear. D- drugs that, that target downstream signaling or systemic inflammation. All these could raise liver associated tests. That's when you see a patient in the hospital gave baseline liver tests. Because if a change occurs in hospitalization, you got to think about these medications, about DILI. And the mechanism, you know, direct. There, there's, there, these are from a lot of papers published before COVID-19. We have other coronaviruses. And we have data how coronavirus can infect, infect, infect the hepatocytes. How you can find viruses if you do PCRs. Uh, and there's also indirect evidence, again, reflecting systemic injury and DILI. Thrombosis. This is fascinating. And, and, you know, in, in prison, we've had patients, not at UCLA or Cedars or UAC, but in other parts of the country, where they're undergoing liver transplantation. And the donor happened to have COVID that wasn't picked up. Patients have lost their liver grafts because of COVID-induced vascular thrombosis involving the hepatic artery. Most of the clots we see, however, be uh, venous and arterial. And we just, we just have this paper published um, looking at this issue. Here's a patient, case report from Fresno, uh, about a patient with PBC doing great for a while. Also, liver tests go sky high. Oh, my God, what's going on? Are they complying? Are they taking a new medication? It turns out this patient's elevation liver tests were associated with extensive thrombosis. Extensive. And when we clear the cloth with the IR's help, the liver test uh, went back to baseline. So change the clinical status. You know, think about these things about hepatic injuries from daily. Think about uh, the hypercoagulable state causing clots. You know, these are the mechanisms, and, and you read them later if you want to. But, you know, extensive complement activation, coagulation activation, cytochrome storm, et cetera. The other thing that, that we've seen, and, uh, and we saw a case about a year ago, you know, cholangiopathy, a secondary cholangitis, that on imaging, it can mimic PSC. You can miss on the ultrasound. So if you have a patient who you, who you suspect, you know, who has, a, who has a cholostatic picture, you know what this means, right? High oxfos, high bilirubin. Think about sclerosing cholangitis from COVID. You need to ask those type of questions. Um, Dr. Bishoyani, where's Bishoyani? Are you awake, Bishoyani? You look like you're falling asleep. That was a heavy lunch, huh? So, so Dr. Dr. Yanni and I and a, and a team of people got together and we combed the medical literature. We combed the medical literature. We found 22 cases published in medical literature. Uh, most were men. Uh, and you see here the difference in ethnic uh, races and ethnicities. Um, you know, alcohol was not a very commonly reported. Um, patients had comorbidities, they had overweight, they had hypertension. And here are the laboratory values we saw that you should expect if you, if you were to buy secondary cholangiopathy from COVID. Bilirubin could be as high as, uh, the median mean uh, bilirubin was 14. The mean alcohol was 2,000. You know, and these patients, unfortunately, the outcomes, unfortunately, it's a very progressive condition. Very progressive condition, and they eventually require liver transplantation or they succumb to this illness. Dr. Yanni and his team looked at, 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 the, at the MRCP finding. The MRCP was, was the most common modality to investigate, to diagnose secondary cholangitis. And again, you see a lot of beating 
banding of the other of the, of the bile ducts. Um, we looked at uh, at therapies, and it's all over the board, right? Ursodial, this, and that, nothing worked. Progressive disease. If you have a patient suspected of COVID cholangiopathy, you gotta call a, a transplant center. And in this city, you have a number of excellent transplant centers. These are the mechanisms for cholangiopathy. Dr. Yanni did one step further and kind of looked at, you know, why is cancer special? Why does everybody get this? And it turns out the biggest risk factor, besides being a man, these patients tend to be all intubated. So your patients who are sick with COVID and they're intubated in the ICU, on positive pressures, they're at a huge risk of this cholangiopathy. Uh, this is my chemistry. Okay, so another thing, which another topic I like to talk about is, is vaccine induced uh, 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 hepatic injury. And the way we, the reason why we study this, I got a call from a friend of mine, another, you know, another hospital here in Los Angeles, that he had a patient who had autoimmune hepatitis doing great for a number of years. Great. All of a sudden, they cannot manage autoimmune. They did all the stuff Dr. Hong talked about, more prednisone, they tried mycophenolate. They, could all, they struggled, struggled. And then we had a patient come to UCLA, transfer from the Valley, for liver transplant evaluation. This lady was so yellow, you turned the lights off and she was fluorescent. It's like she put, put a highlighter in her, in her eyes. So yellow. Her billy was at 15, 17. Interesting, her liver tests were like 1,700, 2,000. You know, and we look at her, and like everybody else, we examine her. It doesn't look like she's cirrhotic. You know, and, uh, and, and we did a biopsy. It was read as autoimmune hepatitis. Woohoo! You know, we put her on prednisone. Got her, she, you know, she got better. No need for transplant discharge. And, and, and after a question in the clinic, when it was more relaxed setting, right? Not all the people running in the room. We asked about different things. And one of the things we asked about was a COVID vaccine. And she had received the COVID vaccine two weeks before this hepatic injury. Um, that was back in October. You know, and I just saw her on, on telemedicine this week. And her liver has been known for three months. And we keep on lowering her medication. So we decided to investigate so formally. And, and comb through the medical literature. And Kenneth Chow is a medical resident from Harbor, UCLA. Uh, and, and went through medical literature, found you know, a number of studies where hepatic injury has been associated following the COVID vaccine. Now, don't get the wrong impression, right? We're not saying don't get the vaccine, right? We're saying if you have a patient in your clinic who has unexplained hepatic injury, keep it differential because your, your, your treatment would be very different. We found over 30 cases in medical literature. Uh, most were women. Uh, and they're from all around the globe, around the globe. Most people were from the United States. And, and, and um, the time from vaccine to, to hepatic injury was between two and four weeks in the majority of patients. You know, a fraction had a history of autoimmune disease, the autoimmune liver disease. They had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid problems. Um, a number of people were on some medications. Um, and, and like Steve said, the symptoms... You know, autoimmune liver disease is very nonspecific. But there's no pathognomonic finding or symptom or sign uh, of autoimmune liver disease. Uh, and here are the liver tests. You know, you see here the, 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 the peak values, the peak values. Uh, you know, about 1,000 AOT, 1,000 AST. Look at the bilirubin. Almost 14. The octopus is about 300. Uh, and only about half the patients had a positive ANA. So it does take a good index of suspicion. Um, uh, about 80% had a liver biopsy. And, you know, we, come, we look at all the reports one by one, you know, medical literature from the case reports. You know, there's no common finding. You know, they're emphasized plasma so kind of we see with autoimmune hepatitis. And here are the patients who were treated. Uh, most patients received prednisone. Because the diagnosis, to be honest, in most of the case reports were in retrospect. They thought that patient had autoimmune liver disease, gave him prednisone. And for the most part, for the most part, they got better. You know, uh, 31 out of 32 patients are alive. Most patients responded to one course of prednisone, 
Some people require a second course of pregnancy, so a little more refractory. The one person who unfortunately didn't survive, um, for some reason, according to the paper published, the family declined uh, the patient getting pregnant. So I'm not sure why that is. But the outcomes are very, very good. So again, when you see people in the office and you see, you know, elevated liver tests, you know, ask about vaccine. And, and, and this phenomena, this phenomena uh, about, about vaccines cause elevated tests is really not specific to COVID. There, there's a body of literature out there showing that the other vaccines, flu vaccines, et cetera, pneumovax, could temporarily transiently raise liver enzymes. Uh, not sure to the same degree we see with COVID vaccines. Again, the message, the message is that, you know, we should all be vaccinated, but keep in the suspicion for COVID vaccine-induced liver injury. This paper was published without any, any revisions required of the, of the journal. So future considerations, it's an evolving area. You know, and the COVID patients we saw two years ago are a very different type of patient we see today. And so a lot of these liver injuries, we ask ourselves, are they specific to a variant? You know, and we're also not clear to what degree does a vaccine ameliorate, mitigate the manifestations or penetrance of these liver complications. You know, and always a very sensitive issue is, you know, is there a difference in vaccine manufacturers? And we just don't know. So in summary, the cause of liver injury in, in a patient affected by COVID can be stratifying to several buckets. Direct liver injury, about 25% of people can have elevated liver tests. It's due to bile duct problems. And keep your back in mind, secondary cholangitis. That's often a very progressive and unfortunate, very fatal conditions. Think about vascular conditions. Think, remember the hypercoagulable state. Think about patients with PBC. You know, all of a sudden, I had this huge increase in liver tests, unexplained, due to clots. About a liver transfer recipient in the East Coast who unfortunately passed away from a pateriotic uh, thrombosis that was acute. Changes in clinical laboratory parameters should, should prompt investigation for COVID-19. Uh, and, and when you see a patient who, who has elevated liver tests, you know, query them, ask them, you know, when was your last vaccine to COVID-19? So at this point, uh, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. All right, Mohammed.